to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for proof for correction for instruction and in righteousness that the man of god may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work second timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. We welcome you today to our study of the inspiration of scriptures. How good it is to know and, and to have our faith built upon the Word of God which came from the very mouth of Almighty God. We welcome you to our study. We're so glad that you've joined us today. As always, we want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. There's a host of Bible study materials there. We've got articles and questions and answer, a lot of good videos on our website, and all of it's free of charge. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website and fill out our media request form. We'll send that to you free of charge. We'll even pay the shipping. Now let's turn our attention to the study of the inspiration of the Bible. Why is it important? Why do we need to think about uh, the inspiration of Scripture today? Well, friend, this is a subject that we desperately need to study because there are so many people who just think of the Bible as a good book of, uh, of good stories that has some practical application in certain parts of life. Well, friend, the Bible is more than just a book of good stories. The Bible is the good book. It is the Word from God. John 6, verse 68, Simon said in response to Jesus' statement, Do you want to go away also? Simon said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The Bible is the book, God's book that has the plan for salvation. The Bible is more than a book of good stories. It's going to be our judge one day. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, he who rejects me doesn't receive my words. He has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. Not just a good book of moral stories. The Bible is God's word that is one day going to judge our life at the end of time. You know, the Bible is also important for us to understand the inspiration of Scripture because of the confusion that is being taught in society on very important matters, matters about God and creation. There's so much that's being taught in schools and universities as it relates to how we got here and why we're here. And yet all along, God revealed that to us in the Bible. You know, the world wants to say, many millions or billions of years ago, there was some great explosion and out of that, nothingness man came over eons of time and yet friend if I believe the Bible's inspired I know that's not true because the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth Genesis 2 verse 7 says the Lord God created man out of the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being the heavens declare the handiwork of God the elements show His power, His glory. Friend, unlike what we're told in society, if we can be convinced that the Bible is God's Word, we can understand we are the special creation by the miraculous hand and power of Almighty God. Why else do, is studying inspiration so important? Friend, it's so important because there's so much religious skepticism about the Bible. You know, there's a lot of people who believe the Bible, but they don't believe it fully. They'll say only the words in red are inspired, or only these books, or this book and not that book, and can we really trust all the Bible? Friend, the Bible says the entirety. 
of God's Word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 160. The Bible says that it is the divine will of Almighty God from beginning to end. It is truth. John 17, verse number 17. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm chapter 19, verse number 7. And so we can do away with all the, the skepticism that exists today by showing that the Bible is the Word of God. And so let's think in the time we have remaining, let's look at God's claim and then let's look at the evidence to see. Can we know for sure? What does the Bible claim? And can that claim be backed up by evidence? Friend, here's God's claim. The Bible claims to be the very Word from the mouth of the God who created us. I want to draw your attention again to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, listen to the all-inclusive nature of it now, all Scripture, not some, not just the words in red, not a, a few verses or this book or that book, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration is a compound word in the Greek language, which means it's a, it's a conjoining of two words into one. It is the two words, theos for God, and the word penoustos, which means breathe. Literally, it means to exhale. And so when the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration, what's that mean? God exhaled, and on His very breath were the words of the Bible. The Bible claims to be words from the mouth of Almighty God. 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21, the Bible says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved or guided by the Holy Spirit. The Bible's claim is that when Paul or, or, or John or Mark picked up pen, the force behind that was the Holy Spirit of God. God is the source of of the writings of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write to you. These are the commands of God. What's the Bible's claim about inspiration? Paul said, here's the claim. What I'm writing isn't from me. It's God's commands. When men wrote, they wrote down the words and the teachings and the commands of God. As we referenced earlier, Psalm 119, 160, the Bible says the entirety of God's Word is truth. From beginning to end, the Bible's claim is that it is fully and completely inspired. Now, let's elaborate on that idea of inspiration just a little more. When we say the Bible's inspired, what, what exactly do we mean with that idea further? Well, the, the Bible means that it's full and complete. When we say the Bible is inspired, that means it is everything we need to get to heaven. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, the Bible says that according to His divine power, God has given to us all things for life and godliness. The Bible claims that it is everything I need to live a godly life and to have the best life. John 16 verse 13, Jesus promised His disciples who would receive the Holy Spirit that when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. It's all we need on religious matters. I don't need any other books. I'm not looking for a latter-day prophecy. I don't need a prophet today to tell me what to do. The Bible is everything we need to get to heaven. Secondly, when we talk about inspiration, that is that it is verbal. It is given to us. The Bible is given to us in words. Not in pictures. Not in a, a movie. God gave us the Bible in words. How did that work? 2 Samuel 23, 2 is a great illustration of that. David said, His word, God's word, was on my tongue. When David spoke, when Jesus spoke, when John or Paul or Luke spoke, the word on their tongue, was God's Word. It is verbally, in words, inspired by Almighty God. Then a third aspect to inspiration is this. 
When we say the Bible is inspired, we're also recognizing that the Bible is perfect or infallible. If God is what the Bible teaches us, that He's perfect, He's true, He's right, He has no fault. If God is who He claims He is, and He is, then friend, the Bible, His product, will also be infallible. John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Listen now, your word is truth. God's word is true. Infallible, it does not contain errors. James 1.25 puts it this way, it is the perfect law of liberty. And so we're not talking about a book of mistakes. We're not talking about a book that, that has claims that it cannot back up, that makes errors. No, there have been a lot of critics who've looked at the Bible. And throughout the test of time, the evidence in the Bible has stood those criticisms. But then a fourth aspect of inspiration, not only is it complete, not only is it complete in words, not only is it infallible, but the Bible is also authoritative. That is, this is the final voice from God that matters on all things concerning religion. Jesus taught us this very clearly. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Paul said, This is the commands of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, And on that great day, Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15, when we stand before God, books will be opened. And friend, I'll assure you, one of those is the Word of God. John 12, verse number 48. And so, let's consider then the evidence, okay? That's the claim. We've seen why it's important. We've looked at the claim the Bible makes. What evidence is there that the Bible actually is inspired that holds up this claim? Friend, one of the great proofs of the Bible's inspiration is its uniqueness. I want you to think about this with me. The Bible is one of the most unique books ever written. It contains 66 books or letters inside of it. Those letters were written by 40 different writers. 66 letters written by 40 different human scribes. That encompasses a time span of about 1,500 years. From the oldest book in the Old Testament to the last word in the New Testament, you've got a period of 1,500 years. Many of those writers were from different countries. They spoke different languages. They had different jobs or trades that they were involved in. But here's what's amazing about that. They all say the exact same thing. Moses does not contradict John. Uh, Mark does not contradict Jeremiah. On all matters, there is exacting unity and harmony. And you say, okay, well, let's, let's think about that a little further. Why, what's the big deal in that? Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that we were going to look at just one topic over a period of 1,500 years, and we were going to put together a volume on that. If say 40 writers today, over 1,500 years, were to put together one volume on one subject, what's the chances of them all being in complete harmony? Let's just say medicine, for example. If we were going to put together what people believed 1,500 years ago, compared to what they believe today about medicine, does it say the same thing? Now, there's a lot of things that have changed. And you could say that on any subject. Were you to take 40 people today and ask them to write on one subject, you wouldn't have the harmony that you have with the Bible. Friend, to have those letters written by different men, different countries, different languages over a 1500 year period and they all say the same thing? That's amazing in and of itself. Why did nobody ever disagree? How is it the case that they didn't take issue with one another? They didn't know each other. How, how did all that work together? Friend, this helps us to see the overriding force behind the Bible was it Jeremiah, was it Moses, it wasn't Isaiah, it wasn't John, and it wasn't Mark. It was God. Each of these men were directed under the power and the control of God as they were inspired to write these books. And so one of the first and most amazing proofs is the uniqueness of God's, design, of God's divine word. But let's mention another proof that I think really shows the inspiration of the Scripture. Prophecy 
found in the Bible is a great proof of inspiration. You know, when we say prophecy, we want to kind of define that a little bit. We're talking about the ability to foretell future events with such minute and exacting accuracy that the only way you could know those is if you had divine help. You know, unlike fortune tellers or palm readers or astrologists or psychics today, there's, you know, I'm seeing somebody in your family who's got brown hair. Well, wait a minute now. We're not talking about somebody somewhere doing something. No, this is exacting, minute detail that you couldn't have known unless you were either there or you're God. And friend, to know it in the future, the only indication is that was God who gave that? Now, let's give some examples of that. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 9 through 12, and in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 12, God promised to Israel, He prophesied to Israel that they were going to go away into Babylonian captivity under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, and that after 70 years, they would be released. Now, Jeremiah has written prior to this, several years prior to this, and so did this come to fruition? It absolutely did. Nebuchadnezzar, according to history, Nebuchadnezzar took God's people captive. The leader of that, or Babylon, took them captive. Nebuchadnezzar was the man in charge, and it lasted exactly 70 years. Now, for him, how did Jeremiah know that was going to take place? Jeremiah's written well before that. How did Jeremiah know that was going to take place? How did he know Babylon would do it? How did he know Nebuchadnezzar would be the king or the leader? And how in the world did he know that it would last 70 years? No way he could have known unless God told him. And that's the point. God inspired these men. Prophecy proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that these things are true. Let me give you another example. Isaiah 7 verse 14, Isaiah prophesies that a virgin shall bring forth a son and you will call his name Emmanuel. Now here's what's amazing about this. Isaiah is writing 750 years before Christ. A virgin? Wait a minute, it don't work that way. It takes two people, man and a woman, to bring a child into the earth. Everybody knows that. And so not only is it in the future, but it defies natural laws. And so a virgin is going to bring forth a son. Call his name Emmanuel, God with us. What's that all about? We open our Bible to Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. 750 years in the future, fast forward, and we hear these words. You shall call his name Jesus. Matthew 1, 20 and 21, Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary. He is called Emmanuel just as Isaiah said he would in Isaiah 7, 14. Now friend, you, you can look at the evidence. Dead Sea Scrolls confirm the date of that as well. You've got a prophecy out there 750 years. Not just a prophecy, but a prophecy that defies natural laws. How did Isaiah know that was going to happen? How did he know he was going to do it without the help of a man? Jesus is the exact fulfillment of that. There's no way, no way Isaiah knew that would happen unless God told him. And friend, that's the whole point. Prophecy proves Jesus and God are true. The Bible is true. Let me give you a couple more examples. Uh, the cross is often prophesied about. For example, you can read in Psalm 22 have the mention of Jesus being nailed to a cross. We have the dogs surrounding the cross. We have Jesus being, uh, giving something to drink on the cross. His clothes being divided on the cross. I mean, just numerous minute details. And then you turn to Zechariah 12 and 13, and it is prophesied that Jesus would be betrayed, that the betrayer would receive 30 pieces of silver, and that they would buy a potter's field with it. Now you think about those events for a moment. Psalm 22, thousand years before, Zechariah, hundreds of years before, how could they know he would come thirsty on the cross? How could they know that they would scoff and, and mock at him? How, how could they know that the 30, think about the minute detail, not 29, not 31, 
30 pieces of silver would be given to the tray of Christ. And that then he would take that, throw it into the house of God, and they would buy a potter's field with it. How could he know all that? And say, well, one time maybe it's lucky. Friend, there are hundreds of prophecies in the Bible. It, not just one, not just a few. Every one of them, God gets right. What, what does all that evidence tell us? That these men, they weren't making up on their own. These men, they didn't have the ability to know that. There was a force bigger than them. There was something guiding and directing these men. That's the only way. The only way they could know that is if there was something greater than them telling them that. And friend, that is God. Prophecy is proof positive. God is the uh, author and architect of the Bible, and He was the one who inspired these men to write these things. Now, let me mention another proof. Prophecy not only shows the Bible is the divine Word of God, but also want to show some, some evidence maybe from astrology and, and science and things of that nature that will show the Bible is the Word of God. For example, I want you to listen to the words of Psalm 89, verse number 37. Listen to what Psalm 89, verse number 37 says about the moon being a witness. Here's what David writes in this passage. The scripture records, It shall be established forever like the moon, even like that faithful witness in the sky. Now in this passage, God refers to the seed of David as being like the moon in faithfulness. But isn't it interesting that the psalmist would refer here to the moon as a witness? Why is the moon a witness? What does a witness do? When you, you think about a witness, does a witness not testify or tell what he's seen or heard? See, my friend, the moon is a witness of the sun's light on earth. The moon itself contains no natural source of light. The light that the moon gives off is a reflection, a witness of the sun's light. Now, friend, how did the psalmist know that? How was David able to figure all that out? Did he go up and look at it? Did he get his telescope out and look at it? Did he have the scientific knowledge then to discover that? Not hardly. The only way David knew that the sun was a witness is because God told him. Let me give you another illustration to show the scientific accuracy of the Bible. In the book of Job, we find something about the earth's suspension. Listen to Job chapter 26, verse number 7. That's Job chapter 26, verse number 7. Of God, it says, He, God, stretches out the north over empty space. Now watch this. He hangs the earth on nothing. Friend, the writers of the Bible, they just don't make the mistakes and the scientific blunders uh, that people have throughout the years. In Job 26, 7, how did Job know that God hung the earth upon nothing? You look at history, and throughout history, uh, men have had different ideas about how the earth was supported. Some people have thought that the earth was supported on the shoulders of the Greek god Atlas. Uh, there is a, one of the most interesting and odd ideas is that there is a, the earth is being held on the back of four elephants who are standing on the back of a turtle. Now, friend, you think about that for a moment. While not all the men in the Bible did believe some of these far-fetched views, here's what we note. The ancient Greeks and Romans were the most advanced people in their time. Yet they believed that the earth was held up by poles or by the Greek god Atlas. Uh, uh, how, did, how did Isaiah, how did Job know these things? Some said that it floated on water, and if you went too far, you'd, you'd go out there and perish. We know today that gravity holds the earth up, that the earth is actually suspended in space by nothing. How did Job know that with certainty? Did he go there? Did he see? Not hardly. The only answer is that Job knew that because that's what God told him. 
You know, here's another passage. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 22, we find that not only is the Bible accurate in the suspension of the earth, but the Bible is also accurate in the shape of the earth. Isaiah chapter 40, listen to verse number 22. The Bible says of God, It is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. You know, it's only been just a few centuries ago that scientists have figured out that the earth's not flat. A lot of people, Columbus Day, other, they thought the earth was flat, and if you go too far, you're going to go out there and fall off. How did Job, how did Isaiah know that the earth was round? Friend, the only way, there have been a lot of far-fetched ideas throughout time. The only way Isaiah could know that is God told him. And friend, that's the whole point of the things we're saying. You look at the uniqueness of the Bible. You look at prophecy. You look at scientific information. And there's a host of other evidence you can look at as well. And all of it comes back to confirm the Bible's claim of inspiration is supported by the evidence. No man could know these things unless God told him. And that's the exact point that we're trying to drive home today. Now, what's the application of that? If the Bible is true, then friend, I want to make sure and study it. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If this is the word from the mouth of God, man, I want to study that word and I want to know it. If this is God's word, I want to do what it says. Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. And then if this is the word of God, I want to love it. And I want to share it with other folks. I want people to know, hey, this is God's message today. This is the only way to be saved. There is no other hope outside of the message of the Bible. I want to live my life by it. I want to love it. I want to study it every day. And I want to make sure that my life is in harmony with the will of God. And so, friend, we hope that today's lesson has encouraged you in the inspiration of the Scripture and maybe motivated each one of us to be better students of the Bible and live in such a way that we bring God glory in our lives. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. The Gospel of Christ.